Uh, first of all, welcome. Uh, I'll do introduce myself. I'm Mark McDader. I'm an associate professor in the Department of English and Writing Studies here in the Faculty of Arts and Humanities. Um, my areas of specialization are um, something called digital humanities, which is a sort of a newish area that relates to the employment of digital technologies um, in the pursuit of the study of the, tip, the sort of conventional areas of the humanities like literature and music and art and so forth. Um, but I also teach and study in the, uh, the field of 17th and 18th century literature. And it's in that context I'm going to be talking to you uh, today um, a little bit about the art of gossip. Um, so let's, let's get her started here. Um, how many of you are interested at all in sort of gossip, and particularly in celebrity gossip? Put up your hands, be honest. Okay, a little bit. Yeah, there are some of you here. That are all right, so I mean, some of you will probably know people like Perez Hilton and so forth, and you may follow celebrity gossip sites or what have you. Um, gossip is, strangely enough, not a new thing. It's been around for, for quite a while, um, probably as long as there's been a society or a culture that could sustain it. Um, and we do, in fact, find that there is a very, very strong sort of a culture of gossip and rumor and scandal mongering and that kind of thing um, going back about 300 years to the to the end of the the end of the 17th century and that's where we're going to we're going to visit now and I want to start by talking a little bit about sort of the geography and the social and cultural makeup of London not our London the big London the real one across the puddle and in the London of about about 300 odd years ago was divided more or less into three sections it was a city of about 700,000 people roughly speaking, and there were sort of three largely cultural centers of it. There was the city, which was here, the old medieval city of London, which was largely about business and finance and retail markets, that kind of thing. It was a place where business got done. Um, we're not actually all that interested in it. We're interested more in these two parts of London, the city, or sorry, the, the town right here, and the court right here, the court being the palaces and the sort of the various different buildings where government business occurred. Um, why are we less interested in the city than the court and the town? The town is kind of the fashionable part of London. It's where the, the upper middle class, the aristocrats, the gentry and so forth would have their, their relatively well-off um, city homes. Uh, it's where most of the sort of the fashionable theaters and so forth were. Why would we be primarily interested in these two parts rather than the city if we're talking about gossip? Anybody? Care to guess? Well, let me ask you a question. Um, how many, and you all probably gossip about friends and so forth, but how interested do you think the rest of this room would be about gossip about your best friend? Very, very, very Well, maybe, maybe they all know your best friend, but for the most part, sort of local gossip is of relatively limited interest. It has a restricted audience, right? But gossip about the rich and the powerful, about the people who are high profile in public life and so forth, that sells. That, that's, that's something that has a much larger appeal and a much larger audience. So this is where we're going to be focused on. And in particular, I want to talk for a moment about a kind of a new phenomena that hit the town around 1650, 1660, and into the 1670s, and that was the coffee house. Now, coffee was this amazing new beverage introduced from the Ottoman Empire. It was sometimes called the Turkish drink. Um, and it made a huge wave when it hit England and particular London in about the mid 1650s. And within about 15 years or so, there were coffee houses popping up all over the place. And they sold coffee, obviously, which was this new drink that everybody was really interested in for whatever reason. Um, but they were also more than that. Now, you've all been to coffee houses. You've all been to a Starbucks or how many of you like Tim Hortons? OK, leave now, all of you. Um, we're talking about coffee here, right? So if you go to a Tim Hortons, let's say you're going to a Tim Hortons or a Starbucks or a Williams or whatever, whatever your particular brand of coffee is, and you want to meet with a friend there, you go in and you sit at a, probably a relatively small table that's, that's reserved for about three to four people, or you can set up your laptop, you can do work, but the point is that you've only got the small table. Take a look at this picture of a coffee house in the first decade of the 18th century. What do you notice that's different about it from, other than the fact that people are dressed funny? What do you notice that is different about it from the kinds of coffee houses that you're probably used to? Yeah? Big tables, right. Okay, so what's the impact that's going to have? What change does that make? How does that change your experience of a coffee house? If instead of sitting at a small table with your friends, two or three of them, you're sitting at a big table with lots of people. Yeah? More social interaction. More social interaction, right. Coffee houses are first and foremost not just places to drink, but places to socialize, to, to in fact create a, a sort of a community of, 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 of not just your sort of local friends, but of a much larger group of peers. So they are the perfect 
place for gossip, right? Because it's not just a small group, it's a large group, all of whom have a network of friends that extends far beyond um, what you would get if you just had two or three friends together. So these are places that become absolutely vital parts of the sort of the social and cultural makeup of the relatively upper end of London society at the end of the 17th century. This is where you went to, to exchange ideas, to hear new gossip, to read new books and things like that as well. So the coffee houses become the center also of gossip for that reason. They become the place where gossip is being disseminated. And for that reason, we should be unsurprised that there are many people who are, who are not very happy about them because gossip is something that isn't always treated well. This is a, um, an excerpt I'm going to quickly read you from a pamphlet. It came out in 1661, which criticizes coffee houses. It is the interest also of women to have this drink damned. That is coffee, right? Bad, bad thing. Lest the men bereave them of one of their most excellent and appropriate qualities, that is, garrulity and talkativeness. What's garrulity? Right? Chattiness, gossipiness, right? Okay. In this age, men tattle more than women, and particularly at the coffee house, when the number have been but six, five of them have talked at one time. The company here have out talked an equal number of gossiping women, and made a greater noise than a bakehouse. Men are here borne down by clamor, and say they're overwhelmed by the noise, which resembles at times the noise of the cataracts of Nihilus, that is, the, 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 the um, um, roughs of, or the, 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 the cataracts of the river Nile, but always resembles a school filled with children, everyone conning his lesson aloud. So they're noisy places, they're gossipy places, they're chattery places. From the viewpoint of this particular pamphlet, um, what's wrong with them in, in particular? Well, first of all, most people went to coffee houses were men. And so to have men going to coffee houses and being engaged in, in garrulity and talkativeness and gossipiness was bad because, well, only women gossip. It's not a manly thing to do. Men don't gossip, right? Or at least so they thought in the 17th century. So this was a kind of a part of this is about sort of the feminization of men. Men becoming as gossipy as women, becoming tattles and so forth. Um, that's part of the critique that's, that's being, aimed at, uh, being aimed at here. But in general, the, the, the issue here is that coffee houses have become sort of dangerous places where, where men talk too much, where they, where they spread too much gossip. Um, which is why, in 1676, the, the English government introduced a law, a new law, that would suppress coffee houses, that would close them down because they were dangerous places. The government wasn't interested in closing down taverns or pubs or places where alcohol was sold. They wanted to get rid of coffee houses. Why? Well, <clears throat> by the king, a proclamation for the suppression of coffee houses. Whereas it is most important that the multitude of coffee houses of late years set up and kept within this kingdom, the dominion of Wales and the town of Burkwar, free, tweed, and the great resort of idle and disaffected persons to them. So the only people who hang out in coffee houses are, are people who are idle, who don't have real work to do, or who are grumpy, they're disaffected have produced very evil and dangerous effects. For that in such houses and by occasion of the meetings of such persons therein, divers, false, malicious, and scandalous reports are devised and spread abroad to the defamation of His Majesty's government and the disturbance of the peace and quiet of the realm. His Majesty had thought it fit and necessary that the said coffee house be, for the future, put down and suppressed. So we want to get rid of coffee houses. Why? Why does the government want to close them down in 1676? Anybody? Possibly because they are the places where diverse, false, malicious, and scandalous reports are being passed around, and in particular, diverse, false, and malicious reports about the government. And the government didn't like that. They didn't like the fact that coffee houses were a place where people could go and they could complain about the king, they could complain about parliament, they could complain about the aristocracy, and so forth. So they tried to close down coffee houses. Now, hypothetically, imagine for a minute that our, our prime minister, Stephen Harper passed a law to close down coffee houses in Canada. So every Tim Hortons, every Starbucks, whatever, it's closed down. What would the response to the public be? Yeah. We would be outraged, right? We'd be marching, take away my Timbits? Are you kidding? No, absolutely not. We would be outraged. So what do you imagine the response of the English public was to the introduction of this bill in 1676? They were very angry. They were so angry, in fact, that the government had to withdraw the bill after about two weeks. 
the, the, the law lasted about two weeks before the government said, oh, okay, 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 you can have your coffee houses. And they reopened them, and they became, again, centers for gossip and scandal and so forth, um, which the government didn't much like, but they really couldn't do very much about it. So what I'm trying to suggest about these coffee houses is that they are in some ways rather analogous to what we have today now, social media. How many of you are on Facebook? Let me rephrase that. How many of you are not on Facebook? Wow. Jeez. Well, we have this one like and another one over here. Oh, my goodness. OK, well, that's all right. We, we still like you. Uh, key thing here is, why are these places like, why are these places like, social, uh, like social media? Why is a coffee house like Facebook? Sounds like a riddle, but why? In what ways are, is the function the same? Well, what do you do on Facebook? What do you do on Twitter? What do you do on Instagram or what have you, whatever you're on? Yeah. You gossip with your friends, right? You have a circle of friends you exchange gossip with. And the coffee house tables work very much like that. They're like circles of friends. And extended circles, right? Because the way Facebook works is you take something from, a, you share something from a friend's page, and it gets seen by not only your friends, but the friends of the person you shared it from, and their friends get to see it as well, if they share it or if they comment on it. So there are these expanding networks of friends and circles of gossip and, and, and discussion, which, are, which is very much like what happens in these coffee houses. The other thing that's very much like what happens in coffee houses is this idea of sharing stuff, this idea of essentially publishing information, of, of particularly curating stuff by sharing it, YouTube videos or blog posts or what have you, um, and spreading it around that way so that things go viral. Things went viral in coffee houses too, because one of the functions of coffee houses was to serve as a kind of a clearinghouse for various different types of literature, whether it was um, whether it was news sheets or newspapers of the day, whether it was sort of new poems or new books or new plays. Uh, if you wanted to, to access this stuff, you went to a coffee house, and you would frequently find copies of it. Uh, of those kinds of things there. And they got passed around and read by large numbers of people in the same way that when you, when you post something on Facebook, it gets passed around. It, it goes sort of slowly viral. So essentially the same kind of mechanism by which news, information, and of course scandal and gossip um, get spread, or what's happening in coffee houses. In particular, what, one of the most sort of um, potent types of literature that was being passed around in coffee houses were manuscript satires, manuscript poems that were written by the people who went to the coffee houses, who again, remember, were the relatively, relatively sort of upper members of society, relatively well-heeled, relatively well-off, relatively well-connected, um, and they would write poems that were actually rhyming, sat rhyming gossip. And I'm going to show you an example in a minute or two. But what they would do is they would write a, they'd write a poem in which they gossip. That was, that, was, that was a poem, but in which they, they talked about their neighbors or their friends or people at the court or other people that they knew. And they would, they would write it down, they would pass it around. And if you got a copy of it or you got a copy of it, you might decide, ooh, this is really good. I want a copy of it too. So you'd write down your own copy of it. And you'd keep it, but then you'd pass on the other copy. And it would go viral in this way until, until there were maybe hundreds of copies that were being spread around of this poem. Um, now, imagine for a moment, this is a, these, these poems are about the people in sort of the highest circles of society in England. And imagine for a moment that you are one of these people who, you know, who sort of hangs out in a coffee house, and you're handed a poem which talks about scandals and gossips relating to a whole wide range of people you recognize, because these are people who are of your own peer group, they're of your own social circle. And you look through the list of people who are being satirized, and you're not on there. Nobody's satirizing you. Nobody's talking about or gossiping about you. So what, how do you feel about that? Why would you feel upset? Because no one's talking about you. If you are not being gossiped about, then clearly you're unimportant. You don't matter. You have no social status or significance. Oh, poor you. I'm so sorry. So you, you have no social status or significance whatsoever. So these things become not just sort of ways of passing around news and gossip and scandal. They also become social registers, ways of determining who's in and who's out, who's important and who's not important. Who, is social, who has social status and social power and who doesn't? And the key word there probably is power. These are about power. They're about where you stand on the pecking order, the sort of the social, the social pecking order of the day. Um, and when these things were, were, were passed around, they looked frequently like this. This is actually a Latin poem from the period. Um, but they looked otherwise like that. Sometimes they would be gathered together. Um, and you would you'd get a whole bunch of these satires, maybe. And there were thousands of these produced. There were th about three, we know of about 3,000 that were published in this period. There were probably many, many more. 
And you would gather, you get, let's say, 100 of them, 70 of them, whatever. And you might take them, you think, these are really worthwhile, these are great. And you would take them and you could, you could actually take them to a professional scribe. Somebody who was a skilled, skilled with a pen, and they would produce for you a custom-made manuscript volume of these poems that you could put on your shelf. Why would you want that? I mean, here's an interesting point. This particular volume, the one that I'm showing you here, which is a collection of these scandalous poems, um, was actually initially printed, was actually or written out, copied out, for the ambassador from the court of Sweden, who was in London. So it's, it was actually for a foreign ambassador. He's the one who, who paid to have this collection of, sat of satirical, gossipy satires made. Why would he do that? Because it's fun? Why would, it, why would a foreign diplomat want to have these rhyming, gossipy, scandal-mongering sheets. Yeah? Does it give them information on what's going on in like, other governments? Well, in, 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 in the government of India, yeah. <laughs> exactly. His job is to keep track of what's going on in London and report back to his king, right? And what better way to find out what's going on than to read these things? So he had this collection made as a kind of a reference manual. Who's in, who's out, who's sleeping with who, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I, by the way, when I say who's sleeping with who, that's exactly what I mean, because that's what many of these were about. Most of these were about, in fact. So he, he made this collection so that he had, he had a sort of a reference manual available to him for these things. But what do these poems look like? I'm going to show you a really quick example here. This is a, <coughs> pardon me, the first three stanzas of a much longer poem. It, was, it came out in 1682. Um, it was never printed. It was only passed around in manuscript. Um, I'm just going to read the first little bit of it for you here. Um, and this is very, very typical of the kinds of things that people were writing. <clears throat> this way of writing, I observe by some, is introduced with an exordium. An exordium is a sort of an introduction, a kind of a, a, kind of a formal introduction. But I will leave to make all that ado, and in plain English tell you who, <clears throat> who. Now, redacted is a word that I've removed there. I probably don't need to tell you what the actual word was. It's a word that you're very familiar with. You can, you can use your own imagination. So what does the first stanza here say? I'm not going to give you fancy words. I'm not going to give you a fancy introduction. In plain English, I'm going to tell you who's doing who. <laughs> That's essentially what he, go, what he does. And what he goes on to do is precisely that. He then gives us a list, a long series of stanzas in which he deals with individuals. And each of the bolded bits here is an individual that he's relating to. So Grafton, the Countess of Orary, etc. Grafton sets up for ogling and sharp answers and lies with all her witty set of dancers. Her crop-eared lord, who is so brisk and airy, is managed by the Countess of Orary. Lumley has fox with nose as red as cherry, and when they are alone, they are so merry. His younger brother, who's so famed for nonsense, has <clears throat> or will <clears throat> Williams on my conscience. And it goes on and on and on like this, Sometimes in extremely graphic detail about who's doing what to, to, to who. Um, again, come back for a moment or two to the, the fact that these were in bold. When they were printed out, when they were handwritten, they were actually handwritten in bold. Why would they be in bold? What's the advantage of that? Sorry? Yeah, so you can scan through it really quickly and say, oh, there's somebody I want to read about. And so you can, you can it's, again, it's almost like an index or kind of a register, right? So this is a typical example of this kind of literature. And again, it's all about who's sleeping with who, who's doing what to who. Oops, hang on. Let's try that again. There we go. Um, and so important was this information that it actually becomes a means to have control over this information, becomes a means of power. It becomes a way of sort of being in control. So one of the poets of the period who was very, very good at this kind of stuff was this fellow here, the Earl of Rochester, young guy. Um, led an extremely licentious life, died probably of syphilis in, in, the, uh, in his 30s, um, but a brilliant, brilliant poet. And he wrote some brilliant satires. And the way in which he got the material for his satires were told by an historian by the name of Gilbert Burnett is this. The Earl of Rochester found out a footman, that knew, a servant in other words, that knew all the court, and he furnished him with a red coat and a musket as a sentinel. So he dressed him up, disguised him as a soldier, and kept him all the winter long every night at the doors of such ladies as he believed might be in intrigues. Okay, what's an intrigue? No? An, uh, an affair. Oh. Right, somebody's having, a, somebody's having an affair, a sexual affair of some sort. So he posted these servants outside of the doors of women who he thought were probably involved with somebody, right? In the court, a sentinel is a little minded and is believed to be posted by a captain of the guards to hinder a combat. 
So this man saw who walked about and visited at forbidden hours. By this means, Lord Rochester made many discoveries. And when he was well furnished with materials, he used to retire into the country for a month or two to write libels. Libels being, again, these gossipy satires. So the whole point of this exercise was to gather information. He wanted to know who was sleeping with who, so he posted spies to find out who was sneaking into whose, whose rooms late at night. And then he would take that information and go to the country, and he'd write these long poems. Some of them, as I say, absolutely brilliant poems. They were actually really good stuff um, about gossip. Why would he bother doing that? Why go to that trouble? Why write this stuff? Why hire servants to stand outside people's doors to catch this information? Why is this information important? When you have a bit of news, a bit of gossip, a bit of scandal or whatever that nobody else knows, what position does that put you in relative to your friends? Yeah. The higher social power? Yes, right. It's about power again, right? You have this information. It makes you powerful. It makes you important. And what's more, if you are really, really good at writing satires that can, that can skewer people, that can ruin their reputation, that gives you power as well. People become afraid of you. So, for example, you may or may not want Perez Hilton to publish a, a post on you. You might think that it makes you seem important. On the other hand, you know, he's read by enough people, he's powerful enough that it might have a really, really bad effect on your career or your reputation or what have you. Rochester was like that. He had that kind of power because he collected this information, he had it, and he knew how to use it properly. So it's about power. It is a currency. It is a, it's like money. It's all, about, it's all about who's in control. Now, all of this matters ultimately why? Well, it matters to some degree, to a very great degree, because of this guy here, King Charles II, who was the King of England at this time. And King Charles II was, in many ways, a very interesting and competent monarch. Uh, he had, however, the reputation of having a great many mistresses. Um, and I pictured here just, just four of them, um, one or two of whom you may have, well, now Gwyn, you possibly have heard of. That's the, this one up here. Um, he had numerous mistresses. And the rumor was that whoever was his current mistress had an incredible amount of power and could, in fact, influence government policy. So who was sleeping with the king becomes not just a personal matter, it becomes public. It becomes a matter of government. It becomes a matter of public policy. And this is true also of ministers and people who had other influential uh, roles to play in government or at state or at court. Um, all of this gossip becomes sort of powerful and important from a political standpoint as well. And ultimately, uh, having, again, access to that information made you more powerful. The final point I want to leave you with is this, that we have, I think, a very clear distinction in our own culture between the public and the private. What goes on behind closed doors stays behind closed doors, right? You know, we, we have this idea that, you know, what the public man or the public woman is different from the private man or the private woman. What all this suggests, what this sort of use of the political, the, uh, use of gossip as an instrument of power suggests, is that, that distinction between public and private wasn't nearly as strong in the 17th century. They were different animals. They fought differently than we did. And who the king slept with, or who the, you know, the minister of state slept with, was a public matter. Because it had, they thought, public ramifications. So there's this merging of the public and the private, which makes gossip and scandal not just sort of, you know, fun stuff to exchange with friends, but real matters of state, stuff that's really important. That's one of the reasons why we study it. Okay, I'm going to leave it there. Are there any questions about any of this stuff? Are you going to, anybody going to go home and like write their own little gossiping uh, scandal? I've often been tempted to. Anyone have any, any questions about any of this? There any questions about the English department in general? Or about Maybe English, yeah, English in general. Something to hand out for that Or about well? the School for Advanced Studies and Arts Humanities, which I also teach in, if anybody has any questions about that. Yeah. Um, is English a course that you have to take? That depends on the program that you're in. Um, English is a course that is frequently taken as a, as a non-special selective in other, in other programs, but the, the the individual, no, there's no, there's no requirement mm -hmm. across the board for everyone to take the first year there, English course. There is a requirement that you must uh, complete a 1.0 uh, uh, essay course, and doing an English class is an easy way to do that, especially yeah. first year English, because it's one year, you get that essay course done and out of the way, you don't have to worry about it. Yeah, I, I teach a first year course, and I have students there from 
um, everything from music to geography to science to et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. But there's also other sort of English courses, like there's children's literature that is a full year, you can do that, and there's other specialty topics like science fiction or the Harry Potter class, which is what I'm in uh, actually this semester. So I mean, there's other ways to get the uh, essay course. So. Any other questions about anything that we've talked about? Yeah. You can probably talk about that Well, uh, Harry Potter. Um, <laughs> so it's a half a semester class, so it's a .50 credit. So you do all seven of the Harry Potter books. You do the sixth movie. Um, there's actually only one essay. So that's actually, it's, uh, it's quite, uh, in my, uh, what I know for English, it's actually quite long. Uh, but you also do other novels. So you do The Book Thief. You do Mockingjay, so that's the third one in The Hunger Games. You do 1984. And there's a bunch of other short stories, like there's Sherlock Holmes. And there's um, uh, An Old Nurse's Tale, which is a gothic tale and stuff like that. So there's a bunch of different stuff. It is a lot of reading, so it's a lot better if you've read most of the novels. I'd read all but one. So it's, uh, it, it is a really good class. She compares the Harry Potter themes to a lot of different things. So like she'll com uh, compare Nazis and uh, to Death Eaters and Voldemort and stuff like that. And she talks about dystopia, and it's really quite interesting. I do like it. It's a very different way to look at something that I read throughout my entire childhood. So, Any other questions about any of this stuff? No? Okay. All right. Thank you very much. I have... Thank you. I have some pamphlets here, some brochures about the Department of English and the, uh, the program. 